Hello everyone and welcome to this uh, lunchtime session uh, of the Dublin Economics Workshop. It's Friday lunchtime session. There's one more to go to finish out the week at four o'clock. Uh, the topic of the day is how can policy aid the recovery? Um, and um, just before I uh, go into the detail and introduce our, our, our uh, uh, panelists for today's uh, webinar or this, this lunchtime webinar, I just wanted to acknowledge the work of Dublin Economics Workshop um, as a tool, a vital tool in providing public policy thinking as a collaboration between private sector, public sector and academia, and to single out within that the work of IGES, the in-house government think tank. I think at the last recession we didn't have the benefit of having uh, IGES, um, and you can see in some of the presentations that we've seen in the analysis presented, it's clear that that's informed public policy thinking and indeed it provided that, you know, was a source of the speed at which public policy has responded to the pandemic. So uh, we're here for an hour and a half. We have three speakers, which will speak for about 15 to 20 minutes and we'll take questions and answers. Uh, please use the question and answer function on Zoom. You'll be familiar with it by now. And I'll be able to put your questions to the panelists as best I can. Um, obviously we have over 200, 300 people tuning in already um, and then I'm going to rise. So I'll do my best to get around to as many questions as I can. Um, so use the question and answer function slides and uh, the video will be available on the DW website. It'll be available afterwards, after the session. Um, and if you're following us on Twitter, please use hashtag DEW2020. And um, for those of you who are following things on Twitter with DEW2020, you should know um, who was to thought that um, we also share that acronym with the guys talking about Drive Electric Week and um, Directed Energy Weapons, which, have, which uh, uh, is to do with uh, uh, debate about the fires in, in the United States. So just if you don't make sense of what the DW 2020 remarks are, um, it's probably uh, something to do with, uh, with that. Uh, so our lineup uh, is speaking in order. I have Philip Lane, Chief Economist with the European Central Bank. I have Francis Wan as Chair of the National Competitiveness Council and I have uh, Mr. Mr. Leo Radker, TD. So first up, I'm going to introduce uh, Philip. Uh, Philip Lane is Chief Economist uh, and Executive Board Member of the European Central Bank. He's formerly the Governor of the Irish Central Bank, Professor uh, of International Macro Macroeconomics at Trinity College. Uh, he's lectured and studied in Columbia, Harvard. He has a list of publications, citations and associations to his name. Um, uh, Philip and I are, are contemporary from uh, our time in economics, hanging around the 330 section of the Lecky Library to get our economics books. Um, there was a theory at that time that I uh, subscribed to, which is if you actually just even held Keynes' general theory of uh, employment, interest and money in your hands, um, if you held that book in your hands, it, by osmosis, it might come into your uh, knowledge. Um, but I suspect, given uh, Philip C.B., he might have actually read the book as well. So over to you, Philip. Thanks, Eric. And it, it's a uh, big lab to have the opportunity to speak to the Dublin Economics Workshop. So, you know, uh, in the mid 90s, late 90s, um, you know, I was, would have been a regular participant, and it's quite interesting at that time in the run up to, to the euro. So, of course, in recent years, uh, um, the, the physical uh, classes between uh, other meetings and the DW uh, hasn't made it possible. And of course, uh, this format where we can have our, our uh, conference online actually uh, allow, allows for me to, to, to participate in this way. Um, so what I want to do is really try and uh, uh, explain where I think we are in terms of the recovery uh, phase. That I, th I think the, there's really four stages uh, to the pandemic uh, shock. Uh, stage one uh, was uh, in March in, in a very intense way. There was the kind of instability of learning about the shock. So of course, uh, Huge agenda in terms of public health, uh, huge agenda for all sorts of, uh, for everyone really. But from the point of view of a central bank, the agenda was stabilization. Uh, you know, this news uh, caused, you know, a, a lot of uh, rethinking, a lot of uh, running for safety in the financial, system, financial markets. And so it was imperative that the first step was, was to stabilize uh, markets. Now, of course, uh, hand in hand with us having to do this, and um, more or less in the time, same time frame, of course, governments had to come in to stabilize incomes. And of course, uh, you know, very rapid adaptation to deliver uh, programs like, like the uh, pandemic unemployment payment and so on uh, needed rapid fire decision making. 
so, so that's stage one, uh, very important to do it. Now, stage two was essentially the, uh, you know, I think what happened really between April and uh, August, or even now going into September, which is a little bit of a mechanical rebound. So when, when you kind of lock down uh, the economy and then you unlock, there is going to be a significant rebound because, of course, when you basically uh, re you know, absolutely restrict all sorts of economic behavior, once that becomes more possible again, a, a lot of activity can resume. Now, I think that was uh, known in advance that there would be a phase concentrated in uh, uh, between April and September, um, we think in quarters of data. So now we're you know, near the end of quarter three. So what's interesting is uh, what's next. So the, the net, what's next is basically how to sustain the recovery. The recovery is far from complete. And even when there's a, a kind of physical, you know, at, le at least a lightening of the restrictions. And by the way, in our ECB concept of the next year, uh, we assume there will be still a degree of restrictions uh, to, to deal with um, uh, local outbreaks, to deal with basically the preventive nature, which is, of course, social distancing and wearing masks and so on is just so important to, to preventing uh, uh, an increase in the infection rate. So uh, I think uh, what you know, the issue is, it's not so much the fact of what is you know, permitted, what is possible in terms of economic activity, which is uh, where is the demand uh, going to come from? Is it the case that everything's going to snap back perfectly so that once you liberalize activity, essentially everything picks up where it was, which is kind of V-shaped narrative. And of course, uh, there's really two reasons to, to doubt that. Uh, one is um, uh, there's a natural degree of nervousness. Uh, I'm going to talk a little in a second now about households, but households are going to be uh, nervous about spending, and we observe still, uh, uh, you know, unusually high savings rates. So that nervousness is, is uh, an issue. And then on the firm side, again, uh, the the kind of uh, hurdle at uh, uh, rates or the, the degree of confidence to to have major investment plans, um, and especially you know in terms of. Uh, longer range plans uh, is, is going to be more limited. Uh, and this is why it's, uh, so that's one issue is the demand side of it. And then the other side is reallocation, is although many firms can fully recover, many activities can go back to normal once the pandemic is, is uh, uh, you know, uh, contained, uh, not everything, not everything will come back in the same way. And of course that real, reallocation challenge um, uh, it, it is uh, something that to be recognised. So in this recovery phase, which is you know at the very least uh, the rest of this year and probably throughout all of next year, uh, requires a significant uh, support. Uh, of course, uh, I'll talk about monetary policy in a minute, but also uh, this is where we think uh, it, it remains the case there's a very heavy lead role for fiscal policy. Because I mean that you, Avery, you mentioned that uh, you know uh, Keynes, and this is really um, I think uh, you know the concept of an of a kind of replacing private demand with, with public demand and replacing loss of private sector income with, with you know um, uh, support from, from the state, especially in those sectors um, which are which are still subject to restrictions. You know, is going to be very important. So, so this is a uh, phase three. We had stabilization. We had the mechanical unlocking. We now have this uh, sustained recovery phase. And of course, looking beyond that, uh, if you go beyond 18 months, um, then it's also what's going to be the new normal. You know, is it the case we're going to see, uh, you know, long-term changes in terms of uh, travel, in terms of office work, all of that, and also. Uh, of course, even before this pandemic, uh, we knew there's a lot of very significant trends which are kind of coming together in the next few years. The uh, carbon transition, the ongoing digitalization of the economy. So, so these were happening anyway. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it remains the case, you know, uh, that, that there should be a clear focus in terms of um, planning and kind of the direction of investment spending to recognize that. And of maybe, let me make the loop back, which of course, 
knowing what comes after the pandemic in terms of those investment challenges, that does influence the nature of the fiscal policy that may be appropriate over the next 18 months, because why not accelerate? You know, given that there's a lot of uh, unemployed uh, resources, a lot of spare capacity, the competition for uh, project workers and so on is going to be more limited now. Maybe a lot of what was, was inevitably going to happen anyway can be accelerated uh, in this phase. And also, let me mention, uh, of course, uh, even though this, this should be, I think, uh, quite a ambitious co uh, combination of policies uh, through this recovery phase, uh, you know, it's a natural question to ask because this happened uh, uh, 12 years ago, 10 to 12 years ago, is after that intense phase is over, um, w will there be kind of a medium-term support for the economy? And this is where the fact that we, the European Recovery Fund, um, you know, where Ireland was, was one of the promoters of that, it is important because that's a five-year plan. And, the, you know, it's going to be important for next year or two, but it's going to be, you know, also important uh, for the next five years in terms of providing a, a secure, a stable source of collective funding, uh, which is going to be important. Okay, so uh, central banks, uh, we're more uh, about the short and medium term. Uh, those longer term issues, uh, you know, only uh, indirectly uh, come in our direction. But our direct role is to make sure that there's enough uh, support to make sure that, that the short and medium term recovery uh, is secure. So uh, maybe if you go to the next slide. And so, you know, one of the key issues is, uh, you know, in terms of the private sector is uh, the behavior of households. So what you, this graph shows over the history of the Euro, uh, Euro uh, essentially, by and large, there is some you know, variation in the household savings rate, but in the aggregate, it only varies in a minor range between 12 and 14 percentage points of disposable of income. That's what's happened until this year that we have that kind of range of variation. Now, we all understand the reason why there's this huge uh, surge in the first half of this year. I mean, there's a, the concept of forced savings that you really just could not go out and, well, first of all, maybe uh, you physically could not consume in some areas, and in another type of air, uh, sense, the conditions were, were you know, uh, such that, 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 you know, many people prefer that not, not to be consuming too much. Um, um, in terms of uh, beyond the necessities. Now, what we've seen uh, already is a big uh, resumption. So the savings rate is not remaining at 25% of income. But it's also the case, our graph here shows over the next 18 months in our baseline, uh, we're not assuming it snaps back, it snaps back to the normal range. And this is where, if you like, it's very important that households have the confidence. They can see uh, a vision about why the recovery is going to be there. They can see a vision why, after this very disruptive uh, large shock, that the medium term future um, can be uh, secure and that they can be more confident that their uh, employment prospects, their income prospects in the medium term uh, will be secure. But of course, that's going to take time. It's going to take time to be, have more confidence that the pandemic will, will be controlled, that you know, it's, it, it's going to, um, uh, we're, we're going to find, uh, well, first we'll contain it, find treatments, and, uh, you know, and then uh, the rollout of the vaccine. Uh, you know, and this picture is drawn for our kind of baseline, where we think um, our baseline, and of course it's only one version of the future, is maybe you know, a, a vaccine uh, um, found by middle of next year and rolled out late in 21. Okay, uh, but but that's the big question: is how do we how do we provide this, this confidence? Uh, which is you know it's, it's a public health issue, it's a fiscal policy issue. You know, there's many elements in providing the confidence to allow uh, households to come back to a more nor normal level of, of consumption. And on investment, I don't have a graph on investment. Um, you know, it's you know in this period of a you know. Investment very closely follows this, these concepts of confidence and you know, forecast of future activity. So boosting activity levels is very important for investment. Okay, if you go to the next slide. 
So, uh, you know, we, we updated our, our scenarios in, in the forecast we published yesterday. So what does this graph show you? Well, the, the black line to the left shows you what's happened, which in the euro area is a 15 percentage point drop in Africa in the first half of the year. So, so that's basically um, uh, if 100 is at the end of last year, did that 15 percentage point drop. Now, I mean, we use quarterly data, but the reality is within quarter two of uh, April, May, and June, the bottom was in April. There was already some recovery in May and June. And our baseline, the blue line, says that, well, across, in, I think in all scenarios, the current quarter, uh, uh, July, August, September, has quite a steep recovery. So going from quarter two to quarter three, you know, the, the slope there, there's quite a big jump in output uh, in the neighborhood of 8%. Uh, we think for, for the year area, and so then it, it kind of there's a little bit of a uh, a kink there because then it kind of it's still going to grow quite quickly, but but at a flatter rate because once the unlocking happens, then it's less mechanical. It requires you know it depends what happens with policies uh, with the pandemic and so on. And under the baseline, uh, the way to really think uh, the year area will be back to the end of 2019 GDP at the late 22. So, so you know, it, it's um, uh, two, two years away. It's two years away to get back to where we were. Now, th that, that's a long time to be below uh, normal levels of activity, but it's still, it's still temporary. It's not the case. It's, it's, it's not like the Great Depression. It's not even like, you know, the, the many years we had after 08 of really damaged economy uh, in the area. So, so, you know, it's a significant, uh, Hill to climb, but you know that two-year horizon is is it's not open-ended. It, it it does mean if you like going to fiscal policy, significant fiscal policy can be entertained because it's not open-ended. It's for a limited uh, amount of time. Then the you know we recognise in the uncertainty that you know that baseline could be wrong, and uh, you know I, I can well remember going back to May and June. Uh, you know there are various commentators saying we're a bit optimistic in our baseline. Maybe the red line will be what's going to happen, which is the severe scenario. In the severe scenario, uh, there's longer delays in controlling the pandemic and finding a vaccine. And of course, if you have a really big slump in effort for a long time, then you're going to get problems in the in the banking sector. You're going to get problems across all sorts of uh, indebted sectors. And so, so, so that you know, of course, is going to be a much more difficult uh, uh, scenario. Whereas, of course, in, you know, the uncertainty is two-sided. You know, if some of the, you know, um, uh, if good treatments are found, uh, if the vaccine comes more quickly, then then maybe the bounce back can be more rapid, which is the the uh, orange line. Okay, so if we go to the next slide. So the question is, um, uh, you know, I you know, I think no one disputes, and it's pretty clear and obvious that back in March, the central bank had a fairly basic uh, uh, stabilization role, that when the private sector was looking to sell, uh, the only way markets could remain open and to be stable was you need the central bank to come in and be, be a stabilizing force, which is you know, what we did. Um, but it remains the case because of the degree of slack in the economy uh, for the next couple of years, uh, we, we do think as the economy recovers, inflation is going to recover. But, but our forecast is that uh, inflation this year, you know, is going to be on average quite low. Uh, it's going to go up in headline terms about 1% next year, but only to 1.3 in 2022. Since, you know, our, our target is inflation hovering uh, close to but below 2%, uh, what this tells you is that monetary policy has to remain very accommodative because uh, essentially there's not enough mo uh, monetary momentum in, in, in the inflation dynamic. And this is why uh, our focus now is on trying to uh, maintain uh, the, uh, our asset purchase program, which in the, in the kind of current phase, uh, the biggest part of that is the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, uh, which is basically uh, in combination with the uh, very low uh, policy rates, and in combination with our credit policies, our, our Teltros, Teltros uh, long-term refinancing operations, which essentially provide a, you know, a, a large incentive to banks to maintain lending uh, to firms and households. 
um, that th this is going to be a period when uh, we we should be quite active in in uh, asset purchasing. And how does that work? How it works is it it's, it's uh, uh, you know drives down uh, yields in, in the bond market, and in turn uh, that allows uh, corporations to to uh, borrow more cheaply. It allows banks to fund themselves more cheaply and in turn uh, to lower the lending rates uh, they charge to firms and households. And we see that in action. And of course, since the government is, is a big uh, borrower at the moment uh, across Europe, across the world, uh, the low interest rates in, in the bond market uh, also enable governments to fund themselves uh, in this period. So I think, uh, you know, as, they, the, as mentioned at the start of the call, uh, this, this is, a, if you like, a, something uh, that, that is, I think, uh, clear what the central bank needs to do. You know, there's a very high degree of consensus in the global central banking community that the current conditions call for, for this uh, very high amount of monetary accommodation. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, what, what we have to do is pretty clear. Now, I think uh, re repeatedly, I can well imagine uh, uh, even before the shock, there is a curiosity about why are interest rates so low. So even before this shock, you know, our, our main policy rate was at minus 0 0.5, minus half a percentage point. So, you know, for those of us who, who lived through a, a different decade, going back to the 1980s, um, this just seems really odd. Uh, so let me explain in, in my last slide why, why, in fact, this is, if you like, uh, a, a pretty major characteristic of the world economy. So what I show here is what we call the underlying uh, real rate, or star in lingo. So this is the, the real rate uh, which, where we think the economy, uh, w where a fully employed economy will settle down. So if you go back even to the, I don't go back and be even more steep in the 1980s. If you go back to the start of the euro, uh, the real rate was around 3%. And if you think about, well, if the central bank is trying to deliver 2% inflation, the formula is the real rate plus the inflation rate equals the policy rate. So the ECB rate would, have, would have, you know, be around 5% under that scenario in, you know, when uh, there's no shocks. And, uh, you know, I can remember having a mortgage in the late 90s, which is more or less at that, at that price. Even if you go to the last crisis in 08 at the start, the real rate was still around two. So even then, if you like a kind of normal ECD policy rate might have been around four. Now what's happened is the real rate and the, you know, these calculations are for the year area, but it's pretty much the same calculation for the US and basically for the world, is calculations of the real rate are zero or below. So if you like, even if there's a full recovery in the economy, uh, depend, I mean, if I take zero, which is at the upper band of these estimates, and if we get to an inflation rate of two, then the upper band on the policy rate will be 2%. So in trying to think about, you know, what, you know, okay, interest rates are very low now. But if you think, well, even at the top of the market, um, if there's a full recovery in the European economy and we're at the inflation target, the, the, the kind of uh, upper end of the policy rate might only be around two. So that's the short-term rate, the rate we charge, and which influences overnight lending. I'm not saying the 10-year rate that is typical for government debt will be a two, it's usually a premium over that policy rate. But it's a very different world to 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And this is essentially why we can have the situation where, uh, you know, governments, uh, others who are in debt, uh, the kind of running costs of a lot of debt are quite low. And you might say, well, what's behind this? Those who study this question uh, point to reasons why the world is, has essentially a lot of desired saving. People are getting older, they want to save for their retirement. Uh, a lot of nervousness, by the way. So uh, having gone through the last crisis, uh, for emerging markets having gone through the Asia crisis in the late 90s, many governments uh, you know, in the emerging markets, many individuals in many countries like to have a lot of precautionary savings. So there's a lot of savings in the world. And by the way, they also are uh, reluctant to put it into the stock market, even though the long-term returns will be better. 
they want it in a safe form, you know, so uh, high grade government debt and so on. And on the other side, uh, investment dynamics are less than used to be. And uh, that's partly to do with the fact that the world economy has slowed down, the kind of uh, breakthroughs of how to use uh, new technologies, you know, and that's what uh, I expect uh, Francis Brown to uh, explain later on about how, how to boost productivity. But in a world where productivity growth has been low, then investment rates have been low. So if you have that combination of high private, high desired saving, low uh, momentum in investment, then the interest rate that's going to come out of that is going to be very low. And this is why, uh, you know, one of the responses to that is to have governments who uh, step in and provide the investment demand and offset the high private sector savings rate. Because, of course, going back to you, over at your opening, you have the paradox of thrift. That if everyone tries to save too much, then the, you know, that cannot be processed and you, you have a slump. And so, you know, what we have now, I think, uh, where... Uh, Around the world, the governments are, are uh, being uh, very responsive to the crisis. I, I think it, it is uh, absolutely necessary. And again, uh, you know, the same uh, factors, uh, low interest rates, uh, low inflation pressures mean that the central bank should also be very accommodative uh, under these conditions. Uh, so with that, uh, maybe I'll stop. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for that. Um, I know uh, the DEW has chosen to uh, organise these events around the time of my birthday, so I'm going to do my bit to celebrate uh, my birthday tonight and spend and stimulate the economy. So we all need to do a bit more of that. Um, I'm going to move on swiftly then on to Professor Francis Ruan, um, who is speaking in her role as chair of the National Competitiveness Council. Uh, Francis uh, is a former director of the ESRI, former uh, head of the Economics Department in Trinity College, uh, Dublin. She's been on you know, a whole range of different public uh, and policy boards uh, and served her time on, on a range of those, now chairing the NCC. Um, in my time in college, uh, I acted as a research assistant to Francis, uh, looking at industrial policy, which we now call enterprise policy, I guess. And um, uh, she has uh, she's always been uh, personally great uh, uh, and her insights into enterprise policy have always been fantastic. So no better person to chair the NCC. And over to you, Francis. Uh, thank you very much, um, Averick, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, it's a great tribute, I think, to the organizers to retain their, this annual event uh, spread over, over six Zoom sessions this week. And I guess I say this as, as, as somebody who was at the original first ever DEW conference down in Ken Mayer. And that as the OZO line is more years than I care to remember. So let me share my screen with you. Um, I think is that just let me get that. Um, okay, so I hope that everybody can see that. Okay. Um, so yes, the the the. So I'm wearing very much a, com uh, a competitive council hat today. And and uh, as Philip said, mentioned earlier, the issue of productivity, which has now come onto the competitiveness agenda in a very new way. Uh, and I won't be talking too much about that today, but it is something which is clearly going to feature as we come out. But many of the policies I'll be talking about will be seen as contributing to uh, to productivity in the future. So let me go to the second second slide. I mean, a context, and this repeats a little bit of what Philip had, but since it was on the slides, I can't, I can't destroy and rewrite in, in real time. Um, the big issue is how long we'll be living with COVID-19. We, we talked originally about post-COVID. Nobody uses that term anymore because we know we're going to be living with that for quite a while. And the further health measures that will be required, and there's two aspects to those. One is the social distancing ones, which affect how we work and what we do. And the other are the financial implications of actually delivering on those. And I think that's, that, that's pretty vital. Um, there's a great line that the virus doesn't know any boundaries. Somebody in North America, I think, said it on a number of occasions and it's been repeated in different ways. But that doesn't say that the implications for everybody is exactly the same. And that's a really important thing to realize that there are, they are very different. Uh, and obviously there's a sense in which in terms of the productivity, uh, costs and profitability, there are going to be very big sectoral differences depending on the nature of production in those businesses. And you know, we talk now very much about face-to-face -face businesses, something we wouldn't have even categorized many, many periods ago. Um, and there are, within that, there are enterprise businesses. If you're a large or a small enterprise, your ability to cope with COVID is actually quite, quite different. 
Um, and then obviously individual differences because within an organization, you may be in a job which can be done easily from home or done two days a week from home, uh, but there could be other jobs that actually cannot be. So there's quite a, a, marked, a marked difference across the board in relation to that. Um, so I think that does give rise to something which I don't think has been discussed that much this week, but I just want to, to mention it here, which is the long-term impact of the adoption of remote work practices and what that's, uh, what's that going to look like? What is going to be the new normal? Um, it looks the way people are talking at the moment and there's an enormous amount of literature coming out on the management side on this of kind of hybrid working models. And of course, they're looked at very much from the point of view of the organization, the enterprise that's doing that, how, how you manage employees at home and employees in the office. But actually there's a, there's a much bigger issue in relation to that is that whatever choices are made there and the balance will actually um, have implications for society more widely. So if people coming in less to the office, but still coming in, there'll be less congestion and traffic, there'll be less crowding on the streets and actually managing the social distancing will be, will be, will be somewhat what easier. But it does give rise to people asking the question of, you know, what is the role of the workplace in the organization? That's not a question anybody ever thought about before, because working from home and Ireland was quite far behind the curve relative to many other European countries in working at home uh, uh, until, until COVID. Um, but it does, it does actually um, uh, really, I suppose, ask that question when people are in the office, what are they doing versus when they're at home? What exactly are they doing? I know many people who've been told, uh, young people who are in some of the IT sector, uh, who've been told, you know, we won't expect you back into the office until a year from now. And that's kind of like, oh, that's where we are. So that just shows you the sense of which I suppose companies are trying to give certainty to workers. And I'll come back to that issue of, of, of certainty again at the very end uh, and, and how much one can, can do in relation to that. Um, as if we didn't have enough on our plates, the other uncertainties we have obviously are the UK-EU relationship, which came up in the Brexit discussion during the week. Uh, the issue about the impact of this on global growth uh, and the international trade tensions. So from Ireland as a, a small open economy, there's a sense in which what's here for us is actually really very, very, very significant. And I suppose one of the things is that the same firms that are likely to be in sectors affected by Brexit are also the ones affected by COVID. So you get a double whammy in the case of some of those, some of those, those, com those companies. Um, the other issue then just to say, I, I think, and maybe Philip would, would take a different view on this, but I think COVID-19 is, truly global in a way more so even than the global financial crisis because of the extent to which it has diffused. It also makes forecasting extremely difficult. And it was interesting to see Philip's updated um, uh, views from the, from, from the ECB and yesterday. So I just want to put up just a couple of slides uh, in relation to that, just using, using data that we will be uh, using in the, in the forthcoming Competitiveness Council report. And I guess the first really issue is that, that um, when you start to look at these numbers, one of the things you see is, is the wide range from the, let's say the OECD forecasts, which um, are being updated all the time, from, from, no, from no second outbreak to a second outbreak. And just the range of the scenario differences is just in historical terms, very, very wide. So, you know, you looked at forecasts before and the range, these are very, very much larger. And the your commission, your commission has, 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 has us in these data, so a single figure, and then the Central Bank of Ireland goes from, from, um, um, from a baseline to severe. But those numbers are, are in terms of kind of managing and thinking about people, people working with them and trying to judge how do you make decisions on foot of these kinds of, of, of scenario forecasts? Uh, they're indeed a very, very wide range. And Ireland is, isn't, isn't alone in this. Um, uh, we're basically in line with the, the other global forecasts. So again, using the same, uh, but using the European Commission and the IMF on this occasion. I mean, you can see that, that from a world point of view, again, you've got similar range, range in terms of, of the figures that are there. Ireland on this is looking worse, and I think that's a, that's a product of being more open at this juncture. Openness tends to work in different directions for us, and people who've lived through and remember very well the, the global financial crisis, we know it was our FDI industry, which many people thought as a, as a potential weakness to the Irish economy, that was a huge strength in helping us to deal with the global financial crisis on the last occasion. So again, we know that certain sectors um, like pharma and ICT are actually thriving in terms of their exports at the moment, but we know other ones are very, much, very, very much more, more different. So effectively, we've got a world that's uncertain. And if the world is uncertain, then they're going to be uncertain. It's going to be uncertainty, which is going to feed back in a feedback loop back into us. 
So in terms of the, of the Competitiveness Council, we, have our, our, um, we do an annual report called the Competitiveness Challenge, which is, we hope to release towards the end of this month. Uh, and it effectively focuses on the competitive issues for the enterprise sector. And, you know, there's a sense in which this is, Philip mentioned it actually in what he said, normally the, 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 the sort of focus of the NCC is tends to be medium into long, not short, or short, certainly into medium. But actually when you have a, a COVID on your hands, there's a sense in which there's a, there's a reality that you want to look at what it is that, that is, is, um, is actually on, on the table in front of everybody at the moment. So we've decided to focus on four themes this year, uh, and they're in that circle, the supporting Ireland's workers, because obviously the, the numbers there are very large that are out of work, um, addressing climate action, I'll come back to that, resolving long-standing issues. These are the, the, the chestnuts that are still around for years, the NCC has been talking about and hasn't quite had the action that are needed, and then the need to be investing, uh, investing strategically. So let me just, just um, talk a little bit about each of those. Um, so supporting, supporting workers, um, sorry, I just asked too fast, supporting workers and opportunities for upskilling within the economy. And Philip touched on this, this already, so there's a little bit of an echo back from what he said. But just to put up, you can put any of a number of, of numbers up here, but I think this is a kind of a very straight, straightforward diagram to look at, or chart to look at, because at the beginning of February, we actually had nobody on either PUP or TWSS, the, the wage subsidy. So you've got this little blue box at the bottom, and you can see the blue box, which is the, the people on the live register. Um, uh, and th that, that sort of number is, is, has, is sort of a little, a little bit changed, not an enormous amount. But you see this huge green area, which has been landed on us, which is the, the pandemic unemployment payment and the temporary um, uh, wage, subsidy, wage, wage subsidy scheme. And that's been replaced by a new scheme. And I think um, the biggest issue for, for the Irish economy in, in the short run is, is whether or not these numbers turn themselves into long-term unemployment, and then we have the risks of scarring, a topic that was discussed quite extensively at the session during, during the week, um, I think it was on Tuesday. Um, I think a point to note when this happens, it, it's really very impressive actually, how quickly uh, these schemes came in on a kind of month-on-month -month basis. And in fact, we got the data on a week-by-week -week -week basis. Um, and I think it's an important point to recognize that policies are not perfect, but in a crisis, don't wait for perfection because you want to make sure that people have in fact uh, incomes to live on when suddenly you have to shut down the economy. So fix later, that doesn't mean that there won't be a lot of criticisms of some of the aspects of policy that have been done, but it seems to me that, that that's the way you have to, we have to go at that time. In relation to the, the need for upskilling, I mean, this would have been already on the agenda um, because of digitization and automation and in the Irish context because of, because of Brexit. So COVID is kind of added to that. It's like another, another um, um, elixir going into the pot to make it even, 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 even more, even stronger. Um, in terms of two areas, we have been lagging behind the EU in relation to basic digital skills, not so bad, quite good actually on the higher level of digital skills. That may be, you know, there's a need, there was a need to catch up. We may have caught up pretty dramatically uh, during COVID, but we know COVID has given an incentive for people to have those skills. But I think it's an absolutely vital one that we, we retain that. Um, the management skills was an issue also under, under our discussion. And in a, in a context where SMEs are very affected by Brexit and very affected by globalization, Management skills are, are, are tricky for SMEs and they do actually require support for the reason that, that in small companies, who do you send off to a course on how to handle COVID, on how to handle Brexit, on how to handle the new customs issues that are there. And this disproportionately affects SMEs by comparison with large enterprises who can manage that much better. So I, I would see it that both COVID and Brexit are going to give rise to additional managerial skills, uh, as, 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 as particularly also as employers have to reconfigure their business models to adapt to the new realities. So what's the role for policy in relation to this? And we'll be giving in our, in our, in our report, there'll be specific recommendations made to government in regard to it, but it is about getting people back to work quickly and safely. And there's a huge literature, which was again, extensively discussed at the seminar on Tuesday, if anybody uh, hasn't seen it, it's really excellent. Um, there's there's on, on just, you know, the danger of unemployment becoming entrenched. We know what happens in relation to that. And we, we actually have managed to recover very well from the global financial crisis. We need to make sure that that isn't an isn't, isn't an, issue, uh, an issue for us this time. Uh, the upskilling of staff in, in digital management skills, which I mentioned, and these are very much li linked to productivity because it, it's, you know, and again, there's a growing literature, which Ireland is, is, has, has, has had some contribution to, but the 
there's a lot more to be done in relation to that in terms of understanding the relationship between where, when you, where the investment in skills actually shows itself into increased productivity and ultimately profitability and, and, and as it were, survival as an inter, for an enterprise. We then have to identify areas in relation to COVID and prepare for these. There's been some thing, discussion of that, but I think it is a very, it's a very important one because I think if I think back to March and April, we were kind of thinking, okay, how long more? Maybe another month or two. So if you're doing something for a month or two, you don't make big changes, but when it suddenly turns out to be living with this and or other pandemics, because let's face it, we're not sure that this is the first, we know this isn't the first and the last pandemic. We need to make sure, you know, how do we, how do we manage to deal with that in the future? It's a part and parcel of globalization. We've had some of the other benefits of globalization, but we also have to deal with what's, what's in this in, in uh, coming our way. So the, the other, uh, the other, one of the other topics that we're going to look at is the, is the issue of climate action. And I always like to think whenever there's a crisis on, if we weren't discussing the crisis and in the crisis, what would we be talking about? And I think this conference would probably have had a couple of sessions on climate change if it weren't for the fact that COVID has come in and recovery is, is the essence of the day. And Ireland in relation to climate, climate action has been actually pretty good on rhetoric. I mean, because some countries we know west of us uh, are not good on rhetoric, uh, but we're much less, uh, we're not less strong on the reality. So if we just take this, just one illustration that we have in the report, but it's looking at green greenhouse gas emissions per capita in 2018. And uh, the red dots basically show where we were in 2013. And in 2013, we were quite good. But of course, the economy hadn't recovered at that point. And as the economy recovers, then what happens is you're going to get a rise in the, in the, in the, um, in the emissions. So we've had stated objectives. As I say, they're quite respectable. If you went to a European or a global conference saying what Ireland's targets were, everybody would be very impressed. If you asked on the delivery of those targets, I think they would be um, singularly unimpressed. So one of the points that you know, I think is, is relevant now, and I think it's particularly in an EU context, is the greening of the EU and the domestic, the domestic policy targets and new implementation focus, if you like, in government at the moment. And I think there is a potential for change in the context of the change policy environment, not just in Ireland, but in Europe. And it's very clear from the Commission that they're intending to resource um, investment in and innovation in dealing with climate matters and that's where a lot of productivity would come from. So in the short term, some of the issues we, we, we focus on, we will focus on is, is the idea of the role of incentives in encouraging the use of CO2 abatement opportunities and technologies. That effectively means, if you like, in the short term, trying to meet the targets while retaining competitiveness. And we're very aware of the fact that the enterprise sector is not by any matter means the biggest contributor to, to um, to, to, to CO2, but it, it, it still is the case that it has to do its bit as we go along. And we want to make sure that, that the incentives that are there actually in, engage with companies in terms of delivery. The long-term issues, I think, are the ones where Ireland is, we're, 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 we have difficulties sometimes in reaching decisions on long-term term issues. And, and that's because it, you know, the impact implications for any one government are much further out in the future than the life of that government. And nothing is more true than in something like, <clears throat> like climate change. So the shape of policy with regard to decarbonizing the gas network is something that um, I think is, 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 is on the agenda because we have certain industries which are very important industries in terms of employment and in terms of productivity who depend very much on, 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 on gas. Um, third area we talk about is investment in, in physical infrastructure. And that's with the view to the fact that the quality of physical infrastructure also affects the um, the, the productivity of the, of the economy generally. So this is the public investment chart for Ireland from 2008 to 2019. And what we can see is that when the, just before the crash, we were at um, 10 billion in terms of, of what we were spending and that collapsed right down to under four. That's, we did that because that was our way of keeping ourselves solvent. And remember in an environment which wasn't very supportive in the outside world at that juncture. And one of the things I think about the present situation is Europe is much more together on this occasion than it was on the, on the last occasion. But, but by doing that, what you do is you end up having a backlog of infrastructure issues uh, coming up later, later on in the cycle. So in terms of policy, I think it is important to keep to reinvest in, in capital uh, stock during, the, um, during the, that period and to anticipate bottlenecks. And I remember in the SRI, we went looking for funding for research on housing in and around 2011, uh, because we knew that the economy was coming out, out of the recession. And it was very hard to get people to understand what we could have a housing 
shortage, a housing problem, people weren't ready at, to engage with it at that stage. It's really important to anticipate what's required. Um, and we need to improve things like the planning processes. These are kind of um, bread and butter issues, but to, to, to avoid problems with, with key infrastructure, which would cause delay uh, and require revisions. And we know that those revisions both undermine confidence in, in, in the quality of the public service, but they also um, mean that, that they, money doesn't go as far as it might go. It ends up in other places rather than where it, where it should be as you go through judicial reviews and other, and other sequences. Um, there's an issue of sharing information across regions. The World Bank did a report on Ireland where they looked at certain costs in, um, uh, of, of costs of, of um, uh, are the delays, I should say, in delivery of public projects in different places around the country. And despite the fact that we're a unitary state, actually there was very significant differences across uh, Dublin, Cork, Waterford, Limerick, Galway. And that just says something about the fact that there's potential productivity gains in the public sector there if one brought in what were best practices. And then finally, I think we need to, to continue to invest, obviously, in priority areas. Broadband is one that's been on the agenda. I think it's, it's COVID has given us, if you like, the, um, uh, the, the, the nudge that it may, it may have required. Um, and I think this is vital, obviously, for people working from home. But I think it's vital to avoid what I call a new digital divide. You'll remember during the 90s, people started talking about the digital divide. There's a new digital divide that I think is very much linked to, um, uh, linked to, to, to uh, COVID. And finally, finally, um, Resolving long-standing issues. This is another way of saying that the, that the um, NCC has been asking government to do things and others to do things for a number of years and it hasn't, uh, they haven't actually quite got the, the space that they need to. So the top one of one of the issues of that is insurance costs, which again uh, have, have a huge impact on, 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 um, on companies. And again, I, I always go back to the fact that any costs that are higher in Ireland disproportionately affect SMEs compared with others. Now I know that Thornish is going to, is, is, is in charge of a group in this, so I'm not going to say anything more than that, other than to say that I'm delighted, and in the, uh, the council we're delighted, that the central bank is now collecting good data in relation to this area, because one of the difficulties has been that most of the information has been very, very anecdotal. There's an issue about the cost of credit, and Philip talked about that. And of course, because of the legacy of the, um, of the global financial crisis, we've actually, relative, relative, we've had to pay more, our, certainly our smaller companies have to pay more for credit than they would in corresponding European countries because of that understandable legacy, but it is, it is, it is still there. Uh, there's the issue of legal costs, an issue that many of you will remember being, being noted by the Troika. Um, and uh, I think that's something which the Troika unfortunately left before they, they, uh, they tackled that issue head on. So it's still there to be done. There's been some progress in relation to um, um, the, the, the developments in, in, in this sort of infrastructure to oversee the legal, legal profession, but it does need to stay high on, high on the target. And one thing I would say, though, in relation to that, that people don't often focus on, I'll show you a quick chart in a moment. And uh, that sorry, Francis, I'm just conscious of time here okay. in terms of the yeah, time sure. allocation. Okay. If you can look so, here. Yeah, so, I, so I won't leave, I'll leave, I'll leave the charts out, that's fine. So the legal costs, it, the legal costs in common law countries is higher generally than the legal costs in civil law countries. So it is an actual bigger burden. There's then the question of, of, of housing costs, which we know very well all about, and childcare costs. So I've just a couple of charts and people can look at them later in the slides, but again, you'll notice on the legal cost there over to the right. And then uh, here are just another one, just in terms, just giving illustrations of what it is, why these issues long discussed in Ireland have, need, do need to be dealt with and haven't been dealt with. So let me do a final slide just in terms of a number of observations and personal observations. And these to some extent are a little bit reflected in what Philip said earlier. Um, consumer confidence is essential for recovery, and that means trust in public health issues are managed. Trust is vital. Um, and the stimulus packages promote consumption and employment and don't go just into savings. Business confidence is required for investment and risk taking. And having watched what's happened a bit in the UK and elsewhere, I think it's vital that government should provide as much certainty as possible in that regard, leaving gaps. Some scheme is going to end. Is it going to be replaced? Oh, we'll tell you in a few months. That's the kind of thing that actually interferes with business planning and, and, and with investments that should increase productivity. The EU and the ECB should continue to de demonstrate cohesiveness and decisiveness, which I think they have done on this occasion, which they didn't do on the last occasion. And final point that, that, that I can't resist leaving you with, uh, because it was very evident in, in some of the presentations this week at this conference, is the incredible amount of information and statistics that were available this time around, the quality of the analysis being done, and the contrast between that and the global financial crisis. So let me leave it at that. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Francis. Um, so we've over 400 people uh, uh, watching. Um, I encourage you to put your questions. I have a number of questions in um, for our speakers. Um, and our last speaker now uh, to conclude is uh, Antonis Leo Baradkar. Uh, Tonish, you're welcome. Uh, he, uh, Leo Baradkar is obviously the Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment. He's held most of the other big portfolios, certainly the spending ones and social protection and on health. Um, uh, he's also a graduate of Trinity College and a qualified GP. He obviously was in the other end from the arts block, then the science end, as we used to call it then. Um, but people will recall, those who are regular attendees of DEW will note that um, 10 years ago, uh, the Tonishta uh, stood in for Brian Lennon, who was Minister for Finance at the time, to, gave, uh, to give a keynote speech on, on Saturday night. Um, and I think it's fair to say that people were quite wowed by that speech at the time. And, um, you know, very impressed from, uh, uh, and obviously that's been reflected in the, in the process here since then. But I'd conclude by, before I introduce, by noting what Dan O'Brien said in the Irish Times at that time, uh, that uh, Tonish's remarks, uh, the, the, the Overadker TD at that time, he was fluent, informed and authoritative. So no pressure, Tonish, though, over to you. Thanks. Uh, th thanks for, very much, um, very much, Avrick, and it's um, a privilege to join you here at the um, Dublin Economic Workshop. Uh, as as you said, at least the first, the first, and perhaps the last time uh, I was at the conference what was in Kenmare back in twenty ten, where I stood in a short notice, not just for Brian Lennon, who was Minister of Finance, but also for Michael Noonan, who was to fi fill in for him, but but couldn't make it at short notice, and uh, it was a really good opportunity for a first time TD. At the time, I was the enterprise trade and employment spokesperson uh, for my party uh, and my job was to um, take down the then minister for enterprise trade and employment Michal Martin so that's uh, that's politics for you um, and things uh, think things change and, and develop but one thing I really appreciated at the time was I had the opportunity to stay the weekend and found the whole thing to be very stimulating and and very enjoyable um, I think uh, the Dublin Economic Workshop, or, or Kenmare as we used to call it, is um, a little bit like Lenti's, uh, but with less poetry and more data. Um, and I do like poetry, but I prefer data. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do this in person next year and maybe even back in Kenmare. Uh, I'm afraid I don't have any slides, uh, but I do have some observations and some political thoughts to add to what you've heard earlier. Uh, and hopefully that will aid the discussion um, as we go on. Uh, the, the question we're being asked is, is how can policy aid a recovery? Um, and I think my first uh, thought about that uh, is, is that any policy decisions now are extremely difficult because the whole situation is so uncertain. This is a recession like we haven't seen um, in our lifetimes, probably hasn't happened uh, in a century. Uh, no rule book, no manual. So, you know, we can look back at previous banking crises. There have been many sovereign debt crises. Um, asset bubbles, very hard to see a comparator for this. Uh, I think if there is one, it's probably something more akin to uh, a war uh, or an invasion, uh, a huge demand shock uh, to the economy. Uh, and also um, wars have phases, you know, you've periods where part of your country may be under occupation and parts aren't, and then you can get reoccupied again. Um, and that's the difficulty that we're in, I think. Uh, this is a virus that isn't going away. Uh, the pandemic is still raging all around the world uh, and Europe at the moment is experiencing a, a second wave, um, uh, one that's different to the first, um, but, but a second wave nonetheless. Um, and we don't know whether it is going to turn out to be as bad as the first wave uh, in terms of mortality and morbidity that remains to be seen or whether it'll be um, much more moderate uh, than the first wave that we experienced back in the spring. Um, I think it's very possible that we're going to see multiple waves uh, of, of the virus and the pandemic, um, whether they are small waves that lap at our feet or, or big ones that um, knock us over again. Again, we just don't know for sure. And I am confident that we will have a vaccine. Some companies say they may have it available for approval as soon as December, but uh, hard to see that being deployed in the community until the first half of next year. Um, but what type of vaccine will it be? Will it be a bit like a flu vaccine that gives you maybe 70% protection and you have to take it every year? Or will it be a vaccine like, like measles, for example, which um, uh, or polio that uh, brings us almost to the point of eradication? Um, probably the former, not the latter. Um, I know a lot of people at the moment are talking about what type of recovery we might have, uh, whether it's U-shaped or V-shaped or the Nike tick or even K-shaped. Um, and I have a difficulty with that because I, I call it the single hit hypothesis. 
it assumes that this pandemic has only had and only will have one economic hit on us. Um, and I think that's actually unlikely uh, because um, it's more likely that there will be multiple waves. Um, if you like, in a wartime economy, multiple reoccupations of part of your territory. And that could see us having multiple hits in our economy. And it's very hard, of course, to, to um, make projections with that level of uncertainty. Uh, in terms of our policy uh, as a government, the, the overriding imperative is to keep the virus suppressed, um, to make sure that uh, our second wave of cases doesn't turn into a second wave uh, of deaths, a second wave of serious morbidity, uh, and to avoid, uh, if possible, a second lockdown uh, like we experienced back in, in April and May. Uh, in terms of where we are now, we've seen a very significant increase in the number of cases, the number of people uh, testing positive for COVID-19. Uh, the incidence was about um, four or five per 100,000 of population, 14-day average, um, back in June, uh, now up to about 35, uh, 40 per 100,000. So, you know, a 10 times increase in incidence in only two months, uh, which is very significant. Um, but when I was training to be a doctor, my, my professors and my consultants always said to me that you should never treat a blood test. Uh, you should never treat an x-ray. You should never treat um, a lab result. You treat the patient. And what actually matters is what impact are those cases having on morbidity and mortality. Uh, and at the moment, the answer is not very much. Um, yes, the number of hospitalizations has risen. Uh, it's about 50 now. But that's in the context of a health service with capacity for 11,000 uh, and more. Um, the uh, number of people in ICU between five and 10 hasn't really changed in a very long time now. Uh, and the number of deaths last year, four deaths from, from, from COVID in August last month, um, relatively low, uh, still four deaths, uh, still four families that are grieving. Um, but in the context of 2,500 deaths from everything else that month, uh, not a major cause of, of, of mortality in Ireland uh, so far for this month as well. Uh, and we do know that other countries, countries, to give you two examples, like the Netherlands, like Austria, uh, have consistently had higher incidences of the virus than we do, uh, probably around 50 per 100,000, uh, and have not seen uh, a significant increase in uh, ICU uh, admissions or, or deaths. Uh, so, you know, I think there is a level at which we can live with the virus. Um, and uh, it probably is somewhere around where we are now or somewhere uh, a little bit higher uh, around where the Netherlands and Austria are at the moment. Um, what we want to avoid, though, is what we now see unfolding in Spain, uh, which actually is a very worrying situation uh, where the incidence is seven or eight times ours. It's uh, um, over 200 uh, per 100,000 population, 14 day average. And there they very definitely are seeing a significant increase in hospitalizations, ICU admissions uh, and mortality. And that's what we have to avoid. Uh, and we have to take any necessary measures uh, to avoid that happening. Uh, so um, that's the kind of policy milieu in which, which we're stuck in at the moment as a country and as a government. Um, the best economic policy, I, I firmly believe, is, is to put public health first. Um, that is the best economic policy. Uh, if your staff and your customers are sick or, or worse still um, dead, um, your business isn't going to do well. Um, but of course, putting public health first doesn't mean public health only. And of course, we have to take in other considerations uh, like the economic and social consequences, mental health, a growing issue now, um, child development, uh, and also the second and third order effects, for example, the fact that uh, other necessary healthcare interventions uh, are, um, uh, are being delayed. Uh, from the government's point of view, uh, our, our macroeconomic and fiscal policy uh, at the moment is to run large deficits, uh, but we want to be, if you like, in the middle of the pack um, when we compare ourselves with our, our Eurozone uh, peers, other, other, other small to medium-sized countries in Northern Europe in the Eurozone. Um, and uh, we don't want to be the best boys in the class in terms of fiscal policy, but we don't want to be the European country that has the highest deficit as well as a pretty big debt uh, going into this uh, because if things do change um, we're the ones who I think would be picked off first or become most vulnerable so uh, the strategy that Pascal Tony uh, is pursuing is to uh, run a large deficit but to be in the middle of the pack uh, when compared with our peers. Um, obviously everything we're doing is being facilitated by, by cheap money due to central bank policy and uh, I think that will probably continue for a prolonged period and I think it probably should. Um, but of course, none of that is without consequences and without risks. Um, 
whether it's the cost of refinancing that debt in a few years' time, whether it's the depleting value of savings, whether it's the risk of financial asset bubbles, or even the risk of inflation down the line, and we have to be wise to those um, th- those potential consequences. There is there is no such thing as free money, and I'm always amused to see some of the um, uh, the columnists in the newspapers, you know, talking about uh, these great examples that we should follow. For example, um, you know, land annuities, which were essentially perpetual debt, you know, land annuities led to the economic war in the 30s when we decided we wouldn't, didn't want to pay them anymore. You know, that's, that's where, where perpetual debt and consoles led us. Uh, and also uh, some people using examples like the restructuring of the debt, debts after the First World War. Um, the mismanagement of debt after the First World War was a major factor in hyperinflation in Germany, which uh, helped um, this little Austrian man to get elected. So, you know, we do need to be aware now of um, the long-term consequences of some of the monetary policies that are being pursued are the potential long-term consequences. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at a deficit of about between 25 and 30 billion this year, probably closer to 30 billion. Uh, and we will be aiming for a, a lower deficit next year, um, you know, getting back on a trajectory to balance the books. Uh, but that will depend on how the pandemic uh, unfolds. Um, touching on something Francis said earlier on, one thing that we're going to do very differently to the last recession, uh, because we can, uh, because interest rates are so low, is we're going to continue to increase capital budgets. Uh, so uh, under Project Ireland 2040 and the NDP, uh, capital spending uh, by government is to increase by 12.5% this year from about 8 billion to 9 billion. Uh, that will happen, uh, at least, uh, and hopefully we might even get some better value for uh, some of the things that we want to build uh, and need to build uh, over the next couple of years. Um, I think another major uh, thing we need to do, and we've done it well in Ireland compared to other countries, is to maintain social solidarity uh, and to make sure that as many firms that can survive do. Uh, so welfare payments like the pandemic unemployment payments have been very effective in that. Uh, need to make sure we don't withdraw that too quickly, uh, particularly if people end up uh, being laid off for a second time, uh, which is a risk uh, if we end up in, into a second uh, set of restrictions or a second lockdown. Uh, obviously, continuing the wage subsidies, uh, the UK has decided to discontinue them in October, I think. Uh, we set out very clearly that, that, um, that they run until at least April, and if they have to be extended beyond April, we'll give good notice of that. Um, and I think in the budget as well, we're going to need to make sure that we have uh, extra help for those sectors that are mandated to remain closed uh, for the long term. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on pubs, but there are actually a lot of other sectors that are uh, facing a long-term closure, uh, the whole kind of events industry. Um, uh, live music, uh, conferences, um, travel agents, uh, aviation effectively. Uh, so uh, I think we will need to focus on that in the budget to make sure that those industries uh, are still around uh, in, in, in six months time or a year's time when maybe it's possible for them to operate more normally again. Um, and uh, I, I'm not somebody who usually usually quotes um, uh, Una Malali, but I'm going to do it. And uh, I think uh, she had an article during the week and she talked about people who work in some of those sectors uh, and how uh, they're the people and the businesses that have given us the best nights of our lives. And we do want uh, those skills to survive and those businesses to survive. Um, so I have to say, I don't really want DJs to retrain as lawyers. I don't want re- really want riggers to become healthcare assistants. Um, and I don't particularly want pilots to become teachers. Um, now, as it happens, I, I know a pilot who's now, maths, now working as a maths teacher, and I know an actress who's now working in one of our local secondary schools. And if people have two sets of skills, that's great. Um, but uh, we don't necessarily want people to um, move out of uh, those um, sectors forever because uh, I think our lives will be much, much less for, for it uh, if, if that happens. Um, in terms of COVID itself, I, I think it's been a really en- enormous disruptor. disruptor. Uh, you know, we talk about things being unprecedented. This really is. We talk about things changing the world. Uh, this really has. Uh, and I think things will never be the same again. Uh, this is something that's going to be um, etched in our collective memory. Uh, and also, I think for a generation, the fear of another pandemic will always be there. Um, and we need to acknowledge the fact that there may also be, be more pandemics in the future. We, we managed to go 100 years without a pandemic of this scale anyway. Uh, and uh, in some ways we were overdue for a pandemic and we shouldn't assume that the next one will be in a hundred years time. It might be um, 20 or 30 or 50, who knows. Um, and I do also think that the scare of a pandemic is going to be uh, a new feature of our lives. 
um, new viruses are not uncommon. Uh, we had MERS, we had SARS, uh, we had the Zika virus, for example. And I think when those things happen in the future, we'll be a lot more concerned about them than we were in the past. A little bit like when we started naming storms, you know, we became more aware uh, that, that they were coming and, um, and probably took more precautions than we would have in the past. So uh, I think uh, the risk of future pandemics and pandemic scares uh, are gonna be a feature of our lives uh, for the next generation. And that means redesigning our economy uh, and redesigning our society to, to prepare for that. Um, in, in terms of what's happened as well, I think one thing it has done is cause us to reevaluate what's really important in life. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people have probably felt that before the pandemic, our lives were maybe a bit too fast. We were all operating at 110%. Um, the model was really to uh, pack them in and sell things cheaply. I'm not sure that's going to be the case anymore. You know, airlines are going to be different. Gyms are going to be different. Venues are going to be different. So people are going to need a, a different business model. I think there'll be a lot less of uh, high volume, uh, low margin uh, business uh, and a lot more um, of something different. Uh, and that's going to have consequences too. Um, I think another thing that it's causing us to do is to really reevaluate the value of other people's work. Um, not just the nurses and the paramedics and the doctors who uh, deserve all the praise they're getting, uh, but also people like shop workers, uh, people like delivery drivers, uh, people like cleaners, um, people who uh, are in what we typically call low skill jobs and because their skills are readily available, um, don't get paid very well. Uh, but as a consequence of that, we're undervalued in our society. Uh, and I think now people value them and value their work a lot more. Uh, and that is going to uh, have an impact, I think, uh, on policy uh, and on public attitudes um, over the next couple of years. The pandemic has really exposed and laid bare some of those real weaknesses, some of those real inequalities in the way our society and economy is structured. We knew about them before, of course we did, uh, but probably a lot of us didn't realize they were so bad. Uh, and certainly I didn't. And if you look at the impact of um, of this, of this economic shock on people, it really is interesting to see who is on the pandemic unemployment payment, um, much more likely to be younger workers than older or middle-aged workers, much more likely obviously to be people who work in the private sector uh, rather than people who work in the public sector or for big companies like, like multinationals and so on, uh, much more likely to be migrants than people who are established in this country. And I see now there, there are 352 participants uh, on this call and I kind of wonder uh, how many of us uh, claim the pandemic unemployment payment, um, probably none or very few, uh, but 600,000 people, actually 800,000 people at some point uh, did uh, in the past year, a phenomenal number of people. Um, and it's not because uh, we're any better than them. It's not because um, uh, we have better, we, we, it, like in many ways, it really don't, it was just bad luck. Um, these, are, these are people who ended up uh, in jobs that require a lot of customer service um, and in jobs that aren't as well protected. And uh, we saw how precarious their employment was. Uh, so many people being laid off so quickly. Um, and that's not right. And we're going to need to design a society and economy that is different. Um, that doesn't involve um, that kind of thing happening again. Um, a lot of the things we did as a government in the last few months, we, we, really, we really invented a lot of policy instruments in a hurry. Uh, for example, the pandemic unemployment payment, I, I, I was there in the room when we designed it and we literally said, you know, we can't have a situation where hundreds of thousands of people who are at work today uh, used to earning, you know, whatever, five, six, seven hundred euros a week, maybe more, suddenly have to go down to 203 euros a week. Um, so we invented a payment, um, pitched at roughly 70% of average earnings in, in retail construction, hospitality, the sectors most affected. Uh, and that gave people uh, necessary income support when they needed it. Um, but the truth is we probably always should have had a welfare system or a social insurance system that did that. Uh, in other European countries, uh, if you lose your job, unemployment insurance is better. And at least for the first few weeks or the first few months of unemployment, uh, your income is much better protected. Um, you know, that they're, they're, they're pay related benefits. And I'd like to see us go back to that on a permanent basis, in fact. Um, the same thing goes for sick pay. Uh, we've pretty poor sick pay arrangements uh, in Ireland. Um, there isn't statutory sick pay for most employees. 
uh, and we, in, we invented the enhanced uh, illness benefit because we knew that we didn't want people who were sick turning up for work. Um, yet for the last couple of decades, we tolerated that. Uh, people who um, were sick, who had other viruses, um, who uh, were unwell, went into work, infected other people, uh, shouldn't have been doing that, but had to do that for fear of losing a day's pay or two days pay or four days pay. And I think one permanent change is going to have to be uh, a, a new set of sick pay arrangements and a new set of illness benefits for everyone. Um, in short, a better uh, social insurance system, more akin to what you see in continental Europe, um, which probably will have to be paid for um, through, through PRSI. Uh, and I think that's one of the policy things we're going to have to think about in the next few months. Um, this is all hinted at, by the way, in the Programme for Government, so this isn't some dramatic announcement and uh, uh, if there are any journalists online, um, I'm not going off message. Uh, this, this, this thinking is very much in the Programme for Government, but we are thinking about it and certainly I am. Uh, and the similar issue arises with the wage subsidy scheme, uh, now the employment wage subsidy scheme. Uh, one of the reasons I think why so many people ended up on the pandemic unemployment in Ireland, um, looking at Dan O'Brien's graph the other day, uh, why we had a much higher level of increase in unemployment than other countries is we didn't have a bespoke on the shelf uh, wage subsidy scheme um, like they do in other countries. You know, in Germany, they have a Kurzarbeitgeld system um, that they're able to flex up and flex down any time there's an economic crisis. And I think something we're going to have to have uh, on the shelf and on the statute books permanently now uh, is something like an employment wage subsidy scheme. So that we can activate it uh, if we if we hit a, a second pandemic or if we end up uh, in a new economic crisis, um, and then the third area and the final area really is is around um, uh, around low pay, uh, and part of my my new department's role uh, takes over the role of the low pay commission, um, and I'd be responsible for the move to uh, a living wage uh, over the course of the, of this government, um, and uh, and that's something that that's. That, that's an interesting and exciting project that, that I'm looking forward to getting stuck into. And of course, um, it's up to us to define what a living wage means. Um, it's connected, of course, to a social wage. Uh, a living wage depends on what the cost of living is. is. So it's not just as simple as uh, a single hourly rate. Um, if we can bring down the cost of living in some areas, like rents, for example, uh, the living wage doesn't have to be so high. Um, but it is one of the projects that I'm really enthusiastic about getting stuck into for the next little while uh, that we have um, a higher basic floor uh, and that threshold of decency is raised in Ireland. Um, and I think those are some of the kind of things that might allow us to come out of this pandemic as a better country and a better society than we were going into it, uh, perhaps in the same way as countries uh, went into the Second World War. And at the end of it, uh, those who fought that war uh, demanded that things shouldn't go back to the way they were before. Um, but that the uh, countries that were rebuilt afterwards will be built back better. Uh, and that's really um, the uh, project of this government once we get through the crisis period. So thanks for having me and uh, look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Tonisha. Thank you very much. Um, I know you uh, have to watch your time, so I'm going to try and um, get some questions to you very quickly before half two. And we might go a little bit over for some of the others if we can, but we've got about 20 minutes if we can. For questions. So first up, I think I might go back to Philip though, because it will set a good context, if that's okay, Philip. Um, there was a reasonable amount of discussion you mentioned in your remarks about fiscal policy. Um, the ECB obviously supports fiscal policy through the pandemic emergency purchase program. It's, it's, it's to do with a market failure in, in, in sovereign rates. But we've had a discussion then about, um, uh, 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 you know, how, uh, how, that, how does the thinking inform that? How is it going to evolve over time? And particularly in the context of what the Tanishta mentioned, uh, maybe um, where we might have waves of, of uh, COVID-19 with, with parts of the economy um, not working at full capacity at different, at different points in time. So rather than that central forecast where you've got sort of a, a down and a V or a whatever Nike swoosh we have, um, but this question about how the both ECB monetary policy and perhaps also its support in turn of fiscal policy supports um, a kind of wave function of a recovery where you've, 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 you've depths of trust uh, over the next, the next while. Over to you, Phil. Just watch your uh, microphone there. Um, put on mute you. Okay, so our baseline is very similar to, to uh, what Minister Radcar just said. 
is we are assuming, um, and because we, we would have consulted with a lot of public health experts uh, back in April or May about what's the most likely path. So our baseline does have a lot of uh, uh, recurrent uh, reimposition, uh, re unlocking locally now, not not going back to severe scenarios. There's maybe in a severe scenario we go back to widespread lockdown, but and then it's also assumed over time that that uh, we get better at handling it. We get better better handling in terms of treatment. We also get better handling in terms of well, okay, uh, is it 1.5 meters? Is it two meters? How do we organise an office? How do we organise retail? And you see, I mean, uh, I think we've all seen lots of innovations from firms about how to actually adapt and uh, uh, try and minimize the risk in order to encourage uh, customers to come back. So our baseline is absolutely has that flavor. And in fact, uh, 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 Mr. Radcar has, has definitely a scenario I hear a lot, which is, you know, vaccines uh, may be authorized at the end of this year and then rolled out the first half next year. We're, we're a bit more conservative in our baseline that that's maybe six months later compared to that timeline. So our baseline is absolutely has that. But maybe the more uh, general question is, I mean, there's no doubt that the number one uh, uh, challenge is that there's no such thing as an economic recovery unless we have this public health uh, first approach. So I think public health first, you know, has to be a core principle. Uh, and, and let me, I think, uh, again, uh, in the, the uh, what Mr. Radcar was saying, I mean, the core of it is there, which is, um, and let me just explain this in terms of what the central bank and public debt. And my colleague Isabel Schnabel actually had a speech this morning on this in Berlin, which is, uh, you know, an independent central bank uh, very much has to act independently in the context of fine stuff. The context right now is a huge slump. The context right now is inflation uh, being quiet, which is well below the target. And that's why we can have this combination of uh, this you know, very accommodative monetary policy. But that is not a kind of uh, forever promise. I mean, if the recovery you know, takes hold and it's decent, and you know, if uh, the NTMA would have issued that yesterday, at some point that has to be refinanced. Now, many years from now, a lot of the debt being financed now is many years from now. So it's not an issue for any budget, any time uh, in the lifetime of this government, you know. But, you know, uh, we all remember those of us who are getting old, uh, you know, 10 years uh, suddenly comes around, along, 15 years suddenly comes along. And when we think about this public finances 10 years from now, 15 years from now, these debt ratios will hopefully be mostly, uh, have come down because the economy will have grown. Uh, that you know the, the nominal uh, environment uh, uh, provides some support, but it is the case that um, interest rates are necessarily going to be at, at this level forever. And you know there's a lot to play for here. And by the way, a low interest rate is not necessarily good news, because some of the reasons why uh, an interest rate could be low is basically disappointing economic performance, uh, the the fear the fear factor. So people are saving a lot because of fear. So, you know, low interest rates are, are not necessarily the sign of a successful uh, configuration. Um, but in, in the current situation where we have this kind of external, uh, you know, natural uh, disaster, then, you know, it, it's, you know, when you have that kind of shock, uh, it's very natural for us to, to provide a lot of accommodation. Uh, and again, uh, you know, this is really going back to comparing it to the crisis. We we know with banking crisis, it take about a decade at the very least to to have all that, you know get through the bad loans, recapitalize the banks, all of that. This is this is really very sharp, very intense. But under the baseline, it's you know um, it, it's basically a, you know a three year, 2020, 21, 22. You can imagine shorter than that. You can imagine longer than that. But, you know, uh, it is not the case that it has the unknown, open-ended, uh, chronic element that is true with kind of Great Depression type shocks. With a pandemic, uh, it, it's very sharp. It, it's not instant to recover, but there is, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, conditional on success, public health success, uh, fiscal success, and so on in, in managing the crisis. Thank you very much, Philip, for that. Um, uh, so over to you, Tonishta. Uh, Philip seemed to be saying that there's plenty of scope then to spend or 
uh, cut taxes. It's, it's a case of Lord Lately Chase, but not right now. Um, one of the challenges, I suppose, in the recovery, we've seen the Q2 figures for most economies is Ireland actually has done quite well. It has the sort of the least worst performance in GDP, uh, uh, which is largely, dri largely driven by, by larger companies, which tend to be multinational companies and overseas, and then you have this indigenous base. And within that, there are various challenges from the kind of the startup sector, and it, it's quite a commodity within what we call small firms. Um, I'm just wondering, have you any thoughts in terms of the evolution of enterprise policy more generally? Um, you know, do, do we need another Culloden? Do we need another review of all the things that are there just to look at um, a challenge, which is getting greater productivity out of smaller businesses um, and having them scale and grow? It, it's been a challenge that's been around a while and we haven't quite cracked it yet. I mean, that's, we need to keep our FDI, but can we, can we, uh, uh, you know, can we do something to support indigenous farms and get them going and be more productive? Yeah, well, as, as you probably saw, the figures in terms of modified domestic demand were pretty awful for, for Ireland, um, but, um, but, but GDP not, not so bad, and, and that shows the, the strength, I think, of um, our FDI sector and our, and our big multinationals, and you know, anyone who thinks we don't need them, any, anyone who thinks that we shouldn't continue to pursue them, I think is, 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 is really mistaken. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of industrial policy going forward, something I'm still kind of thinking about and getting my head around, but obviously, uh, a lot of it's going to have to be about um, uh, about about climate action and and and, and de developing a more green economy. I think a lot of it's going to be about digital, um, and a lot of it is going to be uh, cracking this this uh, issue that you've all, that you've you've kind of touched upon uh, the fact that S SME productivity in Ireland is relatively poor, uh, and um, the performance of the large companies and, and uh, multinationals mask um, uh, relatively low productivity. Uh, in our SMEs, and I think those are the kind of things we're going to have to uh, do um, uh, do a lot, lot, lot of thinking about in the period ahead. Um, I do think one opportunity that definitely arises, though, is from is from remote working. And by remote working, I don't just mean home working. Um, I mean remote remote working hubs around around the country as well. And um, it, Again, part of the thing that falls into my policy brief is is remote working. We've just finished the public consultation on, on that, um, and in some ways things have changed so much. We may actually the real real issue may be maybe trying to get people back to the office, <laughs> not not so much remote working. Um, but I do think it is it is a huge opportunity, really, to um, uh, help to balance regional development, to improve work life balance, um, to do things that are positive around climate. We've seen the impact it's had on congestion already um, uh, and also um, uh, and also reducing business costs and the cost of living for people but also is going to raise real issues for our cities uh, and how we're going to reimagine them and um, make them busy and exciting again. Okay, thank you Thomas. Francis I'm going to come to you if I may. You may, you may have a view on the enterprise policy question but um, obviously th there's a focus here one of the remits of the NCC is on productivity um, and I don't even have any thoughts about how we can best uh, tackle that challenge and maybe extend that. Um, you know, we have this challenge of a disproportionate effect in terms of COVID-19 impacting on young uh, people. So it, it raises the question of the whole training um, and the various support schemes to get people back into work and um, active labour market policy more generally in terms of some schemes are seen as more effective, we've learned, than the others. Some people would argue community employment is less effective than, say, Jobbridge. Uh, maybe apprenticeships. So um, uh, if I can ask you that question about basically productivity uh, and indeed just the range of, of supports there to get people back to work. So I just I say in relation to that, I think with regard to productivity, I think it's very important that um, we realize it's kind of a connected piece. So if you're trying to raise productivity, it's crucial that you have the right sets of skills and that's what the, the various um, schemes in the past have shown that what's important is that employees have the kind of skills that they can take into the workplace to, 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 to enhance their, their, their contribution and give employers reason to take, take them on. I think the other point with, um, with productivity is that it, the, 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 if, if, it, if we don't join up the bits, if we don't have a look, and I was very taken by what the Thornish had said, if we don't actually make the connection between the housing, the workplace, 
the where people are, etc. If you don't make that correctly, we can be improving on one side, but you know that old line that it, it, this chain is as strong as the weakest link. It really is very true in this particular area. What we do know, I mean, there's a large literature on what drives productivity, and we know now how important management structures and things are in relation to delivering on that. In the Irish context, we are, we've been, we've taken, if you like, solace from the fact that our productivity numbers look good, but we all know why they're good, they're good because of the, of the multinational sector. We need to now do a lot of work on looking at detailed productivity analysis at the, in, in the Irish, in the context of Irish owned companies and on the, the medium to smaller ones to see what it is is working there. And um, there have been some uh, there have been some research projects done over the years which have pointed in certain in certain directions but well, one of the tendencies there's been is for a large number of schemes to be there so many that you wonder how an sme faced with what one to go for they would actually go in order to work with and i think there is a time now for streamlining for looking at and making sure what is effective and let's have a real conversation about it just because something worked once doesn't mean it works today and we don't have to beat ourselves up over the fact that it's no longer working Thank you very much, Francis. Um, if I may, I'll go back to the Tonishta just for another question just before time runs out, and I might get Philip in as well at the end. Um, the Tonishta, Francis Rand talked about some of the long run issues that need to get dealt with, and that's often a challenge for a political system is you can deal with the immediate, but things that take over the cycle, longer than the cycle of a, of a, of a government can be a challenge. Um, and that, you know, you've talked about infrastructure uh, spending uh, and maintaining that. But more generally, uh, we have this challenge of, of uh, sustainable development goals and, uh, you know, the greening our economy. So I'm just wondering how much, you know, should, should government just adopt the SDGs and try and implement them? Are they being built into policy and your thinking in terms of the work of the department? Yeah, well, well I, I, I suppose that they are, they are already supposed to be built in, into policy. I'm not sure to, to what extent they, that they are. Um, I know one, one of the things we just agreed to do during the week uh, is to make sure that, that all cabinet memos and cabinet decisions are, are climate proofed. Um, and that's, that's, that's a change in, um, uh, in, 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 in our approach. Um, but I, I hope it's not, not a tick box exercise, you know, for a very long time, all memos are supposed to be poverty proofed and gender proofed and all the rest of it. And I'm not sure whether we, we take those things as seriously as, as maybe we should. Um, but in terms of the longstanding issues, the, the, ones, the ones that really leapt out, me, leapt out to me, aside from housing on France's list, were, were insurance uh, and the cost of childcare. Um, and on insurance, uh, I'm now head of a cabinet committee um, to uh, deal with insurance costs, uh, you know, made up of the Minister for Justice um, uh, per finance, uh, a few others. And we're going to have a work programme uh, quite soon to... Um, uh, change the law in a few areas and, and do a few things that we think would help bring down uh, insurance costs uh, for, for business. And, you know, we're just so much an outlier in European terms on, on that, that we need to bite the bullet on it, in my view, and um, was left to a Minister of State the last time who, who did his best on it. But uh, I think having um, it being a project led, led by Thonista and led by a number of senior ministers with Minister Fleming, I think we can make real a real difference there. At least we're going to, going to really try to. The last government did not succeed on insurance, unfortunately, and, uh, and this one needs to. Uh, and the other is is childcare. Um, you know, the level of public subvention for childcare now is, is pretty big, if you think about it. Um, there's uh, the money that goes into ECHE, uh, the two years of preschool. There's the national childcare scheme, and there's also the wage subsidy. So, uh, at a guess, I think we're already paying. Uh, 60, 70, 75 percent of the cost of childcare in the country, um, yet parents are still paying very high fees, and there's something wrong there. And uh, you know, I think we need to redesign those schemes, um, and by all means, put more public money into childcare, um, but insist that in return for that, that we have a cap on fees, uh, and the parents uh, don't face um, the kind of massive fees that they're paying at the moment. That again are just totally out of out of kilter with um, other European countries, and. Uh, then have an upward pressure on wages uh, and make it harder for people to participate in the workplace and have all those other damaging consequences. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm going to have one last question. It's, I'm trying to amalgamate quite a number of things, so apologies to anyone, I don't get around to your question, but maybe a question for all. Um, I'll start with the Thomas and then go to Philip and then uh, finish with Francis. It's just about the role of the various government guarantee schemes and credit schemes supporting business. Um, uh, I mean, it'd be interesting to get Philip's comments on this, but... Um, they're there as, as government policy, but is there an optimal mix uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, 
the, we know there's greater take up for longer run credit, for example, than short term credit amongst firms and some of the schemes that are there. Uh, the scale of the guarantee is another element that's, that's a variable in that. And I mean, I suppose for, for Philip in particular, there's a question about how do we treat these loans? Um, um, how do regulators treat these loans um, uh, going forward? So over to you, Tanj, to first. Yeah, the, the, we, we've quite a lot of guarantee schemes now. I didn't even I didn't even, I didn't even know about some of them until I became um, uh, Minister of Enterprise Trade Employment. Uh, some have a great uptake. Um, the microfinance loans uh, seem to have a very good uptake from businesses with with nine employees or, or, or fewer. Um, and uh, it's going to be an interesting test to see how the new uh, COVID credit guarantee scheme goes because there's uh, up to two billion there. Uh, available um, for uh, companies to, to draw down, and that is five and a half, six year money uh, at a reasonable interest rate. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Uh, one thing I find really interesting is, uh, and I didn't, didn't know this until I took over this brief, is that the majority of SMEs in Ireland don't carry any debt. Um, 57, 60% don't carry any debt um, and uh, um, don't have much appetite for debt. Uh, and I think that maybe touches on the issue around productivity as well. Um, a kind of a fear uh, to take risk, a fear to innovate. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd hope that scheme and the future growth loan scheme and others um, will, um, uh, will change that. Um, but um, again, we're going to see how that develops. I, I'd say France and Philip are probably more experienced on this issues than me and might be able to give you, uh, give you a more informed response. Thomas, and thank you again, if you, if you have to head away. Uh, Philip, can I go to you? Same question. Okay, uh, I mean, uh, what I'm going to say is kind of a, a general observation looking across all of the schemes uh, across Europe. So I'm saying nothing about uh, the particular schemes in Ireland. So I think uh, in kind of international discussions about guarantee schemes, uh, there's no perfect scheme. Uh, it's important to think about all of the different ways firms can be supported. Because of course, uh, the wage subsidy is very important support. In some countries, uh, you know, the, so in other words, I think uh, there's very, a lot of different ways to support uh, firms. Uh, so I think that's important to recognize countries have made different choices. In part, it's this issue about uh, micro enterprises versus small firms versus medium firms. We are large firms, by and large, are multinational firms who look after their own finance needs. Mm -hmm. So if you like, uh, it's important not to compare the issue in Ireland with, say, uh, some of the continents and European countries, where a lot of the guaranteed debt are going to balance to firms which have a track record of raising debt. So the credit risk is understood. They have a, you know, established banking relationship uh, and so on. So, so that's a lot uh, a different context to the fact a lot of our small firms have, don't have debt. And, you know, so the question, you know, so uh, whether it's debt finance, other types of subsidies, uh, you know, uh, the issue about uh, equity and so on. I mean, there's all sorts there. Uh, what, I, what I would say is, um, uh, you know, uh, guaranteed schemes are fully allowed for by, by supervisors because essentially uh, there's no credit risk to the extent the credit risk is transferred to the state. I mean, the state has a contingent liability if that loan goes bad. So from a supervisory point of view, um, there's, there's no problem with, with guaranteed loans. Um, you know, uh, absolutely not. I mean, it does go back to something about, because um, in the end, uh, a lot of this is the shadow of what happens more generally with, with uh, uh, insolvency. So if you've affirmed that that's fading, do we have a good way to resolve those firms? <coughs> uh, restructuring, so, and, you know, obviously there's a degree of restructuring going on here uh, in those sectors mo most affected. So, you know, I don't have any one, uh, one issue here. Um, but I think it's important uh, to basically add it all up. I mean, you have to look at the what's happening with the, with the labour subsidies, employment subsidies, in addition to uh, the issue about credit guarantees, and then, which has been happening here, a degree of just pure grant to, to reopen, to adapt, and all of that. And, you know, I think uh, there's, there's definitely a, uh, room for, for grants because... Uh, uh, you know, a lot of these firms, uh, that's really what, what they need. And, I, you know, I've even, uh, I've encountered myself, people running very small enterprises who have uh, really benefited from the fact of how to go online with a website, how, you know, how to go about um, the, the, this adaptation. So, you know, beyond that, uh, there's, no, there's no magic policy.
Thank you, Philip. Francis, over to you. Just a very final really point on that. I mean, I just want to remember that during the financial crisis, uh, earlier on, the FTI companies in Ireland didn't suffer because they were able to borrow outside the Irish system. And I think a lot of the companies <coughs> here who had borrowed before that suddenly found themselves with probably um, hurt badly and reduced incentive to take up those now. So I'd agree completely with Philip that it's important to, to have a whole range of financing options in the in the, the the on the landscape that firms can can can, can avail can avail of, uh, obviously the suspension effectively of state aid rules is going to have an impact on the behaviours of other European countries in terms of what they do, and we need to be mindful mindful of that because they may affect us uh, us quite differently. But I would I would think it, what's really vital is to be able to, and maybe this is a way of turning. You know, they, they talk about patient centred health. If there should maybe be an enterside center thing where you look at how do all the bits facing SMEs work together, the wage subsidy, the, the, the grant systems, the other things that are there, and look at it, examples of that rather than looking at it as the schemes on a top-down level. Thank you very much, Francis. And look, thanks to all uh, the panelists uh, on your behalf. We have, uh, I'm not sure how we do this if you're in a room, but you get a big round of applause. But my thanks to Philip Lane, Francis Ruan, and Tony Shalia Varadkar. My thanks to you for uh, taking part. Um, our next and final seminar is at four o'clock today, where we tackle the thorny issue of is Ireland a tax haven? Um, with my colleague Barry Rowntree, uh, Seamus Coffey from ECC, Ashley Dunhu from uh, Anderson, and Gabriel Zuckman over calling from Berkeley. Uh, in California, I think. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all then. And thanks again to our panelists. Thank you all.